Well hello again everybody. Now some of you might recognise this AVO wide range signal generator from one of my previous videos. Now I have already made a video about my purchases at the Hamfest, but if you want to go back and uh, see the initial teardown on this equipment then what I'll do is I'll give you a link in the show notes so you can go ahead and do that. So my plans for this instrument aren't really to do a complete restoration. I'm thinking we'll maybe do more of a cold start video today. We'll just see if we can actually get this thing to live again. Although I've got a feeling it may end up being a lot more work than I initially anticipate. So the unit does come complete with its own mains lead and I can actually see that the mains lead is pretty damaged here and we've got the original vintage wiring colours here which in the UK used to be uh, black and red I guess before we became conformed with the rest of the EU when everything went to uh, brown and blue but I always like to see these old uh, black and red colours and uh, it did come complete with this uh, Eddie Swan connector and again this actually says on it made in England so you know back in the day when we actually did make things in England. Now I was actually just going to berate it for uh, not having an earth cord but I can see the cable damage there is actually an earth fitted here there is an earth core so obviously this is a two pin connector and uh, they've only actually wired up the live and neutral but if we do actually tear down into the old flex I can actually see uh, I can see an earth wire I can see a green wire oh hello there you are can you see that there is actually an earth wire lurking inside this uh, piece of flex but uh, not been connected so whoever used this was a you know is a man after my own heart we're not going to be bothered with any of those safety earth nonsense real men don't need earths do they now just working from memory last time we opened up and had a look inside the avo it actually looked in really good condition now i'm sure it's going to need the usual thing of electrolytic capacitors replacing and that kind of stuff any coupling capacitors so we are, we are going to do that but i seem to remember the main problem with this unit that i identified was you can see that we've got these two tuning rings if you like that affect the output frequency well this one is actually to choose the actual scale you want to operate but then this scale should actually turn when you rotate this second dial down here so no doubt you're thinking as I spin this that it's actually just the knob that's got a loose grub screw and it's not engaging on the shaft but I can assure you that isn't the case there's obviously some mechanical coupling here between the uh, between the tuning condenser between the variable capacitor and this knob and uh, there's something mechanically not functioning there so we need to tear into this and try and find out what's gone wrong I've got no idea so it'll be interesting for us to find out won't it right okay so we need to tear into this so I'm, from memory I think it's these fixing screws here that hold it on and uh, we've got to remove this uh, this stand off it this is used to actually stand the instrument up this little wire frame so let's go ahead and just disconnect these bolts well not bolts are the screws che I think they call them cheese head screws don't they I know we've got to undo these to get the cover off so let me do that now, now I did purposely leave these loose last time because I knew that we'd have to be going back in here now I've got to remember I'm not exactly sure how to gain entry to this uh, I haven't looked through the manual in any great detail just looking at it as I start to see it I think maybe this uh, is a very thick aluminium under chassis on here and I suspect maybe I've got to take the uh, the aluminium chassis take the whole chassis and unbolt the uh, the front from it but I'm not exactly sure so just looking at the unit you can see that it's got this great big thick and heavy plate it's uh, it's actually a shielding plate this because all the RF goodness will be going on behind here but it's interesting to see that even back in the day they actually did a little bit of a bodge here because they've got this pillar which holds the front cover on but obviously this plate actually got in the way of it and I can see that somebody's quite crudely just put a notch in this plate they just cut it out with a hacksaw so they could actually get the pillars up so yeah that's a little bit how you're doing that's not what I would have expected from Avo So now that I've removed our RF shield you can actually see how heavy the metal chassis is here and inside here we've got all the lovely RF goodness going on. So here's our main tuning condenser here and uh, that should move in and out but more interestingly is depending on what range you want you need to bring in different uh, inductors which will resonate against the variable capacitor here to form tuned circuits well rather than just having what you might call a you know, normal selector switch arrangement what they've actually got is a, what I think you call this a turret tuner so if I actually just turn the uh, range select knob on the front 
you can see that the whole tuning assembly rotates with the coils and all. Now you can also see there's some pieces of wire here and all they are they just looks like a single core cable and they're twisted together and what that looks like is something's been cut off there. Well nothing's actually been cut off these are what they call gimmicks so what somebody's done here they've decided that they want to actually have a little bit of capacitance on some of this wiring so what they've actually done is rather than installing a, a low value capacitor they've just got two pieces of wire and they've actually just twisted them together so you call these kind of things you call them gimmick wires so here's the RF oscillator valve here so that's our oscillator valve um, you see you've got various tuning coils for each of the ranges and again there's the main tuning condenser there. Now if I do actually turn the, uh, the VFO knob on the front, which I'm doing now, it doesn't really seem to have an effect on anything. It's just spinning loosely. So I think we need to dig into this a little bit further before we, uh, before we actually find the problem. As I say, I think there's a mechanical problem buried deep down into this. So I'm not exactly sure. I think we've got to take this front cover. This front cover is separate to the chassis. So I think we've got to take all the, all the uh, knobs and everything off and then disconnect the, uh, the chassis from the, from the front cover. I'm not exactly sure how we do that. We'll have to play it by ear. Well, I think it's about time for some denobulation. So let's crack on with that. Ooh, some lovely filth under here. Now I also remember there's a, a selenium rectifier under here, so we're probably going to have to replace that as well. Oh, at least they didn't put up a fight, that's good. So you can see here we've got this inner shaft and I think that this inner shaft should actually be acting against the main tuning condenser so that the, uh, the veins of it should be moving in and out. Well I was spinning that round before and the veins weren't moving so I think there's something disconnected in here, I'm not exactly sure what. One, this one's a bit fiddly to get at. Oh, it looks like we've got the front cover off. I can see something moving. I think it's trying to come but I think it's being held by this flex instead maybe okay we're going to lose the flex because we're going to replace it anyway now I can immediately see now what the problem is maybe if I turn it round you'll be able to see a little bit better yourself so we've got this uh, we've got this wheel here this is the shaft and uh, this is the tuning dial here so if i actually turn that the actual tuning condenser inside will be opening and closing so i can see what's meant to happen this shaft here it's meant to rub against this big wheel and as you turn this it's a reduction drive so you know you turn this lots of times and this wheel moves very slowly so it's a slow motion drive if you like and uh, i can see what's happened is this would have had a like a thick rubber tire on it and that rubber tire would press against this wheel and uh, that's how we would do the uh, you know that's what would make it turn now i've got to admit i'm not exactly sure how we can go about repairing that because that 
shaft is uh, that rubber tire sorry is, is is missing and of course that's a problem with a lot of old vintage equipment and that the old uh, the rubber material it just perishes and goes turns into uh, black slime doesn't it so I suspect that's what's happened here because it doesn't seem to be any signs of the uh, rubber wheel inside it and it actually looks as though we've got really quite a complicated chain drive and sprocket affair that goes <laughs> this chain goes all the way around various components I can feel at some point this had some oil on it in the past or grease I guess the first thing I've got to do is somehow I've got to get this uh, this shaft off it looks as though it's held on with some type of clip but I suspect that yeah, I don't know if that clip's going to want to come off. So here's our little capstan with its missing rubber tyre and about the nearest thing I could actually find is a, is a grommet like this. So what I've done is I've actually cut the outside edges off with a grommet and I've, yeah, I've cut them off quite crudely and uh, it's kind of just left me there with this little rubber tyre and uh, it does appear to work. I have tried it. Now I'm, I'm not going to say it's a perfect solution but yeah I think for the moment it's probably absolutely about the best I can do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just try and glue this onto here and uh, hopefully it will last long enough for us to uh, you know get this piece of equipment up and running until we think of a, a more permanent solution. So if you've got any ideas what we can uh, what we can put on here um, to actually try to make a, a new rubber wheel for it. I don't think there's any materials you can cast or anything like that I'm really not sure but um, if you get any ideas, leave it in your comments. Now I wonder what was on here originally, if it was uh, like a little rubber band, a little rubber sleeve, or if it was maybe, um, I don't know, a piece of rubber that was vulcanised onto this shaft. I'm not sure. I'm going to try and just glue this on and hoping it'll, it'll work for a little while at least, just to do a bit of testing. And this is of course the hard bit, getting the rubber tyre back on. Is this going to work? I've got to admit, I've got absolutely no idea, but your guess is as good as mine. What we'll do is we'll leave it for an hour or two for the glue to dry and uh, give it a go. And uh, I'm just going to roughen it up a little bit, just so uh, it can make good contact with this uh, plastic material on the dial. Obviously it goes without saying it's really important to keep your shaft well lubricated. Well, we've got some spinning rotating action so uh, I'm going to take that as a good sign. Yeah, seems okay that doesn't it? Don't know how long it'll last but uh, this signal generator is never going to see a lot of use. Ooh, just notice here the, uh, the end of my knob is really filthy. I'm going to have to go and give that a bit of a clean. I don't know if I'll be able to get the camera in. I've just spotted here that we've had a little fire in this piece of equipment. There's a there's a resistor which is connected to what is that connected to? Um, to the output to the the RF output here. It's got a little coaxial cable, and then there's a resistor, and it goes onto a switch. And I can see that this resistor that joins the uh, the inner core of the coax, a signal cable. This has had a little fire. Let me just take this metal cover off, and then I'll be able to show you. I think. Now I think at the beginning of this video I probably uttered those famous last words about oh this is only going to be a 10 minute job to recommission this and uh, well I guess any piece of equipment when you actually start digging into it you always find far more problems than you were expecting and uh, I was just thinking about that just now and 
To be honest, we wouldn't have it any other way, would we? If we didn't have problems, if all these restorations were just really easy, you know, you change a fuse, plug it in and switch it on, it would make for, well, it'd make for a boring video for a start, but it'd be boring for me as well. So it's actually quite nice to have these problems. You just hope that the problems aren't so bad that you can't put them right. So we've got this switch here, which I think must be the attenuator control. And uh, I can see that it's obviously a very tight fit. And it was such a tight fit that what they've chosen to do is uh, they've machined out just part of this aluminium casting so that they could actually get the switch in. So rather than design it right, somebody's made a bit of a mistake, somebody's buggered up there and uh, <laughs> they've had to machine it out. Now, I'm really surprised because I always thought that, you know, Avo and stuff like that, it's such a quality make. And they were so expensive back in the day, you'd think that um, they got everything perfectly right. But no, that's definitely a Billy Bodge. So we've spotted a Billy Bodge there. And we spotted another Bodge earlier that there was two posts that hold this onto the case. And uh, somebody's had to cut away part of the screening. They hadn't cut into the screening, but the, the outer edges, they've had to trim them off there. So they could get the pillars down. So this thing's full of little mistakes. So this switch here is the output attenuator and uh, I've got a new friend here. He used to be a resistor but I'm just going to call him Mr Crispy and you can see he's now very heavily suntanned because he's all burnt and uh, I can actually see there's a lot of staining this soot on this aluminium cover. So something, something's been on fire in here. You can actually guess what's happened. Somebody in the past has uh, connected the output from this signal generator onto something they shouldn't. They've connected it up to probably something like a, a live I don't know, a couple of hundred volts on a valve receiver or something like that. And of course, probably what they should have done is installed a DC blocking capacitor because uh, I don't see any blocking capacitors in circuit here. So they've obviously just plugged into something and uh, yeah, that was the result, Mr. Crispy. I don't know what resistor value this is. We'll have to have a look on the data sheet. Um, these will be precision resistors though, because it's, you know, that's, I can just tell by looking at the style, uh, because these, these actually are very carefully set the output voltage on this connector here. It'll also be interesting to see, you know, how much other damage has been done, because um, we don't know. I mean, certainly some damage will have been done here. So I think what we're looking at here is here's the output attenuator and it looks like it's made up of a series of these one, two, three 10 ohm resistors and then a number of, well there's also three 80 ohm resistors and then the actual centre wiper of our switch, it actually shows it going up to a 70 ohm resistor which I'm guessing is a 70 ohm impedance matching resistor because back in the day coax feeders and stuff like that would have been around 70 ohms rather than the 50 that we're more familiar with today for communications equipment and test gear. So I'm guessing that 70 ohm resistor is this one that's burnt out here. I don't know but I'm guessing that's what it is. So what we are going to have to do is we're going to have to check really all these resistors and we're also going to have to make sure that well, we've got another, I've got a variable resistor here, a 100 ohm resistor. So typically what you would do on a signal generator, you would actually set what they call the reference level. And you usually set that using this 100 ohm resistor uh, to actually the desired output level. And then you switch in attenuators and they'll give you like fixed 10 dB, 20 dB steps, something like that. I'm not particularly familiar with this instrument, but that's how it usually works. Now we can actually also see that we've got some form of, well I think that's another piece of equipment, this little box doesn't actually live within this enclosure and I have seen some uh, some pictures of other people who've got these AVO signal generators and I think that they would have come with a plug-in lead and that plug-in lead would have would have plugged into here somewhere so that plug-in lead it looks as though it had Looks as though it had the DC blocking capacitors, because I suspect what somebody's done to this, they've actually connected it to, you know, 100 volts or certainly some, a live rail. Now, of course, you get lots of live rails in valve radios, and, I mean, there's an important tip there. You need to be very, very careful when you connect your test gear, because obviously this is a this is circuit, although it's designed for RF, um, it's actually 
got no protection on for DC so if you feed DC voltage into here it's just going to go in and it's going to go through a 70 ohm resistor and then into potentially a 10 ohm resistor to ground and it's going to burn something out which is what's happened so I'm suspecting the uh, the 70 ohms has burnt out in place of one of these 10 ohms which is connected to ground so hopefully we're going to just find that it's only the 70 ohm resistor burnt out but it could have done more damage it may have uh, actually damage this potentiometer here and who knows let's hope that it hasn't got back into any of this uh, valve assembly. I've actually been looking on a few forums to see other people that have repaired these and it seems that it's not uncommon that the uh, the turret tuner inside these for them for them actually to burn out and maybe that's because people have connected stuff to them that they shouldn't have done. So that's a job to do for sure isn't it we've got to fix that. God I like the sound of my own voice don't I? Sorry about that boys. Okay, well just for giggles, let's see what resistance Mr. Crispy is. 38. Okay, well it looks like Mr. Crispy is around, around 38k, which is, uh, is, is not right. So, uh, yeah, okay. So let's see if we can find uh, a 70 ohm resistor and uh, let's sort out Mr. Crispy. Now when I'm working on something old like this I do like to just use a little tiny bit of a flux. Uh, the reason being is because the connections are so dirty, they're so old, um, that sometimes it's difficult to make them take solder and uh, you know the longer it takes you to solder a joint the more chance you've got of damaging a connector or a tag. So uh, what I like to do is I do like to just use a little bit of flux because it just makes sure that the joint just flows that bit quicker. So that's not perfection but you know hopefully that's going to be good enough for us to do some testing. Well you know I'm not sure what it is but this AVO signal generator to me it's just giving off the very faint but unmistakable aroma of shenanigans. I can definitely smell some shenanigans going on here. Uh, so we had that burnt out resistor in the attenuator circuit. We also had the uh, the missing rubber on the uh, on the on the slow motion drive. So to me, um, this is starting to show a little bit of a pattern of perhaps why I paid just a grand total of five pounds for this. So normally, what I would of course do is we'd replace the electrolytics and some of the coupling capacitors, and then very carefully and gradually power it up. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to power it up, and uh, I'm going to see what happens because. I suspect that there's maybe other things wrong with this. But before I put any power on it, we mustn't skip doing a safety test. So that's what I'm going to do now. You can see I've also gone ahead and I've just replaced our mains cable. Switch on. Uh, what test do we want to do? A circuit test and insulation. Let's do that. Let's see if it will pass that. Should do and it passes that so it's safe to put mains power on this anyway. I just want to do what I would call a go no go test. I'm going to put some voltage onto it probably about 50 volts AC. You could start a bit lower if you wanted maybe we'll start at 25 volts and what I want to see is I want to see some mains power on this transformer and I want to see the uh, the two outputs coming from it. So there's going to be a low voltage output, a low voltage AC output which is going to run the valve filaments and there's going to be a much higher voltage output which is going to be the B plus or the HT supply. Being a valve operated device this, this probably has a well it will have it'll have a high voltage DC supply to run the valves. Now I'm not exactly sure what it will be but it's certainly probably going to be more than 100 volts. I'm going to guess 150 volts I'm not exactly sure. So this is our rectifier here and some of you might not have seen one of these before. This is probably a, a selenium rectifier and uh, it certainly looks a lot different if you're used to seeing the conventional uh, diodes. It's, uh, it's maybe not immediately obvious what you've got here. It is actually a full wave bridge rectifier and I'm hoping you can see I've actually drawn in how the diode configuration is there. And uh, the centre section will be our zero volts and you can see there's a wire there. It doesn't help that everything's yellow so I say well we've got a yellow wire connected to this and a yellow wire connected to that. I'm sorry that's not very helpful but if you follow this yellow wire here it's actually connected to the chassis of the signal generator so that will be our zero volts. 
and then if you just know the way that a conventional bridge rectifier works um, we're actually going to have two adjacent diodes to that which are going to be our AC mains so the, that wire there and that wire there that's where we're going to be having our AC coming in from our transformer and then we've got two outside connections here now the two outside connections are going to be our positive DC supply and you can see that one of them goes up to uh, a smoothing capacitor here and then the other one goes via a switch I think they've actually just used the switch here as a tag strip so we've got a 15 ohm resistor here and uh, I think this is feeding uh, again it's another resistive filter so we've got a low pass filter to remove out some of the hum so I think what we'll do next is we will put some power on it I'm going to be looking for some T DC voltage on these two outside connections here and I'm going to be looking for some AC on these two two connections towards the center because they're, they're the AC and we're also going to be checking for our low voltage our, our supply to our filaments our heaters and our valves so we turn the power on we're going to put it up to about 50 volts and we should have some AC coming in Okay, so we've got 100 volts coming in, but we've only actually got 10 volts AC. So as you can see, we've got a dial lamp lighting up here. Hopefully you can see that glowing. So we've certainly got one of the secondaries on our transformer working, but I can't really see very much AC coming in on the other secondary, which would be the high voltage supply. Now we're getting about 10 volts, but to me that really isn't enough. It should be much higher than that. So we turn the power on and I'm only getting about 7 volts there, or 8 volts now. But it seems to be uh, floating around a little bit. I think we'll just disconnect one of the AC terminals just to make sure that we haven't already got a short circuit across our selenium rectifier. Now I don't think we will have a short circuit because I'm using a lamp limiter and I think the bulb would be glowing if I had a short circuit. But I guess we should just discount that, shouldn't we? So I'm going to do nothing more exciting than just disconnect one of the secondaries. And they've done the usual thing of having <laughs> wrapped the wire around it so it makes it very hard to get it off. I've disconnected it now so that's done. So let's get the voltmeter on there again. No we haven't, we've still only got about 7 volts. That doesn't smell right to me. Tell you what we'll do for a laugh, let's shot out the secondary of the transformer and see if we get a spark. Not a sausage. Bum holes. Bum holes indeed. And on that bombshell, I think for today that will do. So until next time, bye bye for now. Bye. <laughs>